through your Bible or your smartphone. We're going to be in Psalm 127 for this first session. You can go and find it and just put your finger there. We will come back to it in just a moment. But, you know, I have to ask, uh, what, are, what are we doing here? What are we doing here? Why are you here on a Saturday morning of all places you could be sleeping in or enjoying this beautiful sunny day? You know, you commit week in and week out to invest in children's and students. And so I have to ask, are you, are you crazy? I don't think so, but maybe there's a slight possibility that we're all just a little, we're a little off because we commit to do this. And that's okay because I like to think of it as we're crazy for Jesus, right? We love the Lord. We love our students and our children. And I just want to say thank you. You guys do an amazing job. Uh, this training is uh, more just to encourage us and to challenge us. Uh, our student ministry, our children's ministry is amazing at this church. And it's not because of Brian and I. We get the privilege to be able to lead. It's because of our amazing volunteers that we have. And so thank you for all you do. I know that it can be difficult. I know that to have this type of love for the Lord and this type of love for these children and students, it can be difficult. I know that um, sometimes it's, we have trouble dealing with them, especially if you've had that one troubled child or that one troubled student that just kind of tests your patience, you know, puts you to the edge of maybe your limit. I also know parents can be difficult. They can make um, requests sometimes that you don't always understand or maybe aren't even all that beneficial sometimes. And you try to help them. But, you know, they're the parents, of course, and so you have to partner with them and kind of walk through that carefully. And I know that they can be unappreciative. I know there are times when you may feel like you don't have time. You've had a really busy week and you're throwing your lesson together. Uh, no one here, of course, but, you know, you got the Saturday night special or even worse, the Sunday morning special. Listen, I've been guilty of that before. OK, so, you know, anyway, we'll just leave that there. But I know what that's like, and I know we wish we had more time to devote, and I know that family ministry is just not easy. And so that's why trusting the Lord in all of this is going to be key. Trusting God is key in serving the Lord. In fact, I mean, trusting the Lord is key to our entire faith for anyone, not just, not just family ministry leaders, but, but anyone, it is going to be uh, key to our walk with the Lord. It's, it's the defining factor of a mature believer. If you think about a mature believer, they're able to trust God in every situation, no matter what. And so that's what we're looking at today. Over the breadth of my ministry and my 40 years in life, the main lesson God keeps pushing me back to, he keeps reiterating this always is trust me, trust me. The more I think about it and the more I experience the Lord, that's what he's driving me at, more and more trust. And so today, we're going to examine that topic from Psalm 127 and look at it in light of families and in family ministry. So we're going to answer the question today, do I really trust the Lord? Do I really trust the Lord? And in every aspect of life. So let's read Psalm 127. This is a song of ascent of Solomon. It says, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stay awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go to rest, go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. And so the image in this psalm right off the bat is of someone who's building something, building a house, right? And this probably meant both literally and figuratively, as we're going to look at today. Now, we can literally build a physical structure called a house. I'm sure we all live in some kind of house or home. But then we also build a home, meaning the place where your family lives and grows, 
right? So you see the difference there in what I'm talking about? Both of these don't happen by accident. Both of them take careful planning. Now, I've never built a house before, but when I was growing up, my parents built a house. And I remember uh, walking around and seeing the empty walls and, you know, seeing the, the two by fours. And as it was being constructed, by the way, is there, is there no better place for a little child like a construction site? Like they love walking around a construction site. I know it can be dangerous sometimes, but it's just so cool. In fact, this, of course, this is way back in the 80s, but in the 80s, we would, me and my friends, we would find construction sites that no one was working on and we just go explore them. I don't know. Did anyone else do this? Okay. I see some hedge, some handshakes. All right. Okay. Don't tell. Okay. Don't tell on me. But you know, the builder doesn't just decide, yeah, this looks like a good spot for a house and just starts nailing some boards together and pouring some concrete. There's a lot of planning that goes into this. There's a, the, the, the architect is involved. Someone is, is designing from, you know, where, where all the plumbing and the electrical and how the, how the roof joists are going to go together. So the structure stays up. I mean, there's a lot of planning. It's got to get approved. Building codes have to be observed. All of that, even before the first uh, board is, is nailed together for the first dirt is moved. There's a lot of planning that has to go into building a house. There's also careful planning that has to go into building a home. You ever notice how every family's a little bit different? We do things just a little bit different. And growing up, you think your family's normal and every other family is weird. But have you ever grown up and you thought, wow, my family's the weird one. Anyone else thought of that? Like you did something, your family did something and no one else's family did that. Anybody? Anybody? So like we, Brian's raising his hand. Uh, Brian did have a weird upbringing a little bit. So talk to him about that. It was interesting because he went and saw a lot of different places, right? Growing up. So um, I just shouldn't say weird. You're not weird. But, you know, growing up, so my family, we, I was born in Arkansas. We had a lot of family from Texas. And so when my mom made chili, it was no beans chili. Okay. That's a Texas thing, right? Lucas, the original chili, no beans chili. Has anybody had that before? Authentic Texas chili? Okay. So I just thought everybody made their chili that way. And so growing up, I saw someone's chili. I'm like, what is this beans? Like, what is this monstrosity? But I actually like beans in my chili now, but that was growing up. I also had buttered crackers growing up as a side dish. I found out people, that's not a normal thing, but we had we just like put some butter in a cracker and that's what you have as a, anyone else do buttered crackers growing up? Okay, awesome. All right. A few of you. So like you grow up and your family is, 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 a, is everybody's family is a little different. And in the home, the parents are the main influencers of what the home becomes. So you have to ask yourself, do you have a plan for what you want your home to be? Do you consciously think about the activities that your family does? The traditions all of the things that you do, the things you celebrate, the food that you eat, that's all part of it. And these things are important. But Solomon tells them, tells us that even if we plan, even if we labor, even if we work out every detail down to the second, if the Lord doesn't build the house, we do it in vain. Anyone else a planner in here? Anyone else, a micromanager, type A personality, uh, you know, control freak. I've been that. I call myself a recovering control freak because I've realized that it's a problem and I try to, but I still ask my wife. Um, my number one control thing is dishes. I don't know if anyone's like this. Like if I see dishes in the sink, I'm like, okay, somebody's got to do these dishes because that drives me nuts to see a pile of dishes. Anyone else? Do you have like a thing? It's almost like a thing that you cannot stand. Like maybe it's like the toilet paper isn't on the roll. Like it just, somebody gets the toilet paper and they just set it on the actual thing, right? Or set it like next to the toilet, but not on the roll. You know, that can drive you crazy too. Anyway, we're off topic here. But the point is that when, um, that, that, that we must, we must make sure that the Lord is involved in all that we do when it comes to building our home. Now, Solomon, he would know something about that, right? His dad, King David, was a builder, built up Jerusalem, built up the palace that they lived in. Solomon was a builder. Solomon built the temple of the Lord. And so they knew something about building. Solomon was also the, one of the wisest 
people ever to live. So we should really listen to him. And he's implying that as we are trying and striving and laboring and wearing ourselves out to build our homes, we must do it in the trust of the Lord. If not, we are doing it in vain. This labor will come to uh, no, no result. It will not result in what we hope or what we want. You know, the parable that Jesus told in Matthew chapter 7 comes to mind. He said, remember, you must build your house on the rock, which is God's word. Then when the storms of life come, you will be able to stand. But if you build your life on anything else, it's as if you're building it on sand. And when the storms of life come, it will not stand. I remember we went on a mission trip to uh, Galveston down in the Texas Gulf Coast after one of the major hurricanes had come through. And you would, we drove down the beach and there were stilts and foundations where homes used to be. And it was really, it was really eye-opening to me because it just looked like kind of like a wasteland. Like there wasn't a board, there wasn't a door, there wasn't a roof. There was nothing, just stilts sticking out of the sand or little foundations where a home used to be. And it made this parable come alive to me because think about that. What, what are the storms of life that come? And if our faith is not firmly cemented in the Lord on the word of God, when those storms come, our foundation will crumble and we will just be completely wiped off. And so we must make sure that we are trusting the Lord in our life, especially when it comes to our families. That's why it's so important that faith is the central belief in our family. If there's one thing we could teach our children is to trust God. One day they're going to go off on their own. We're going to launch them into the world and we can't protect them forever, nor should we. We can't protect them forever. But the greatest tool in life's toolbox is going to be trusting the Lord how they trust the Lord daily with whatever comes their way. This will carry them through the good times. This will carry them through the bad times. And this will help them reach for their dreams while remaining humble and grounded. So the Lord must be the focus in our families. If not, it's as if we're digging a hole and filling it back in and digging the hole again. It's pointless. It's in vain. It's futility. We must trust the Lord Personally, so it resonates in our families. But that's not the only area. We must also trust the Lord in our church. We need to trust the Lord in our church, which is to say our community. So this point needs a little explanation. So really kind of stick with me here. We're going we're gonna to work through this passage, this next part of the verse here. And Solomon's point was the protection of the city. He talks about the walls. He talks about the watchmen on the walls. And there are walls around Jerusalem. There were watchmen that were, that were looking out for danger. And they were about as protected as they could be. In fact, they had an amazing system of protection. Jerusalem was elevated. It had natural barriers on some of the, some of the walls. And they had, there were some, some uh, wasteland deserts around them where they could see if people were coming. So it really kind of limited where armies could come from. And so it was really a really well-protected city. No matter, but, but no matter how strong the city was, no matter how thick the walls were, no matter how vigilant the watchmen are, if they do not trust the Lord, it is all in vain. This actually came to be illustrated in when Jerusalem was sieged during the time of Hezekiah. When King Hezekiah, years after Solomon, the Assyrians attacked Jerusalem and almost overran the city. Hezekiah did not put his trust in the Lord. Instead, he paid a huge ransom. He stripped the temple treasury, stripped the temple of its, of its jewels and its gold, paid a huge ransom to the Assyrians, hoping that would keep them from being just wiped off the map, destroyed. It did temporarily. The Assyrians came back. Again, Hezekiah thought, I will reach out. He found an ally in Egypt. And thought, well, that, they'll help me. They'll come to my aid. We can help protect each other. Well, the Assyrians found out about that. And unbeknownst to Hezekiah, they, they kept Egypt at bay. Egypt was no help in this. So Hezekiah was stuck. They had built up siege ramps. They were attacking. They were, they, they were keeping people from going in and out. The villagers were all in the walls of the city. It was starting to become a dire situation. Eventually, every wall will crumble. Every embattlement will be broken down over time. They cannot stop the Assyrians from taking the city. King, uh, King Hezekiah doesn't know what to do. 
Isaiah at the time, the prophet Isaiah, comes to Hezekiah and encourages him. He says, trust the Lord. Basically, this is his message. Trust the Lord. Hezekiah's done everything else, so he says, well, why not I try to trust the Lord? He prays to the Lord and asks God to intervene and to help him. And that very night, God sends an angel and kills 1, 000, uh, 185,000 of the Assyrian soldiers. Just they wake up in the morning, these guys are dead. They're gone. So that, the Assyrians are like, well, our army is decimated. They back off. They go back to their land. Jerusalem is saved. Not because of the walls. Not because of the watchmen. All of those things are in vain if they didn't trust the Lord. It came down to finally God intervening and trusting God. The difference between then and now is we don't live in a system where our religion and our government and everything is tied together like Israel. It was all connected. So you think about their faith, their, their walls, their city, everything was all connected. We live in separate, separate from those things. We have our faith. We have our system of government. We don't live in walled cities. We're spread out. We have a much different way of life. However, we can think about this in a very similar way. The principle still applies. We live in a community together as believers. And in fact, Israel, the church, is, is the new Israel, the Bible says. And so we can think about this in, in our context in a spiritual sort of manner that we are this kind of structure that he's talking about, the church today. And so I submit to you today, much like a home, we cannot build our community of believers, our church, without trusting the Lord. And if we do, it will be in vain. Now, this might seem like, duh, right? You must trust the Lord to build your church. But there are so many people that just run right past this. They treat churches like they're businesses. They treat churches like they're clubs or even worse, like they don't matter at all. But let me tell you, the church is the representation to the world of the power of the Lord today. Do we understand that? That, that we, the church, represent Jesus to the world. And so this is a special and important, the, commu the community of God is special and important to the Lord. And we are to be a picture, however imperfect, of what it looks like for the gospel to be lived out in this world. We give people a faint glimpse of what eternity will be like. Do we understand that? This is our role as the church. And if we do not trust the Lord, it is all in vain. We are hopeless and powerless if the Lord does not lead us. Guys, we see this over and over and over again. Church after church that has leadership failings, that has doctrinal issues, that breaks down because of infighting and gets off of the, the mark of the gospel over and over and over again. People turn away from the gospel so they can be culturally relevant only to be pushed further and further away from the truth. These are churches that do not trust the Lord to protect them. These are churches that are attempting to pay the ransom that the culture demands, and they find that it's never enough. We can never hope to be the church that makes an impact in this world if we do not trust God. Our children need a church that stands on the truth of God's word. They will go into this world and they will be tested. People will try to convince them that God is not real, that, our, that their faith is one of many, that they, they are not special, that Jesus is not God's son, and our children must be ready to face those attacks. And it is only when a church stands on the truth and trust the truth of God's word and trust the Lord, they will have a chance of standing against those attacks. So our church must join together and say in one voice, we trust the Lord. No matter what, no matter what comes, no matter what siege is laid on us by culture, no matter how often they question our God, we will stand. Our God is the powerful one. He can wipe out an entire army in one swoop. He can shore up our will. He can make our legs strong to stand against the attack on our faith. 
but it's only when we trust in Him. We must learn to trust Him in all things. Our personal lives, our families, our communal life, in our churches, and even our work-life balance. Or we can think about this in our time. So trust the Lord with your time. You know, Solomon keys on on a very important thing here in verse 2. He says, we get up early, we go to bed late, meaning we fill our days presumably with lots of things, lots of work, because the next passage talks of toiling so we could eat bread, but that is the bread of anxious toil, meaning we're worried. We're worried about these things. The assumption is we work so we can control our lives, giving no regard to the Lord. We think the harder we work, the more time we put in, the better we will be. Now, this is not saying that hard work is not a virtue because we do find that in Scripture. Hard work is a virtue. There's plenty of passages that commend hard work to us. We are to work hard, but we must also balance this. We should never be all work. We should never be all rest. Both end in idolatry and sin, okay? It is God who is sovereign over all. We work hard, then we rest, and God controls our futures. Do we see how that works? The last section of this verse completes this thought because it speaks of sleep. Amen. God created us to need sleep. We must stop and rest and recharge. You cannot go on endlessly without sleeping. You will die. You must sleep and recharge. God, have you ever realized, you ever thought about this? God has given us physical limitations on purpose. You know, our minds can really conceive of lots of things. Limit, and we can imagine unlimited things, right? We, we are limitless in what we can think about. But we have physical limitations that will keep us grounded. We want to do more and more and more, but we are limited. You know, that's never been more clear than when you have the flu, right? You're, you're, you're reminded, when you get sick, you're reminded of your physical limitations, aren't you? Right? You, you just, you can't go anywhere. You can't do anything. You're just like, oh, I just have to lay here and hope that the Lord takes me home soon, you know? I remember one time, Christy and I both got the flu at the same time, and we had kids. And so we literally traded off. Like, okay, you go sleep for a couple hours. I'll watch the kids. They were little too. Okay, then we swap. We swap. That we were miserable. If you're if you're a parent, don't get the flu at the same time. Okay, if you can help it. But it was it was really it was really a struggle, and it reminded me of my physical limitations in life. There are all kinds of limiting factors. We can't go a hundred miles an hour without resting. Right. Food is a reminder. We must take time to eat. We are dependent on the air to breathe, right? We must, we have, we must need, we have, need oxygen. These are limiting factors like the fact that we need sleep. But here's the reality. We don't have to worry. We don't have to fret. Because even when we rest, God is watching over us. We can lay down in peace and comfort because God does not sleep. God does not eat. He does not breathe. He does not get sick. He is never tired. And so that's why we can put our trust in the Lord because he is always watching over us. He is always protecting us, always helping us. That is why we must think about the balance in our lives. We have to trust God in our work. We must trust him in our rest. We really need to trust him with our time. We need to think, have you ever thought about how your time, you ever thought about like conceiving of time as, a, as an act of faith? We need to consider that and think about that. He is our God of great provision and can be trusted in all areas of our life, even this area. You know, a good example for the right attitude is the Apostle Paul. He ends the books of, book of Philippians with a treatise on what it means to trust the Lord with our time and circumstances. He says, I rejoiced, this is uh, Philippians, uh, I didn't write down chapter 4 or 5, I don't know, whatever, the, the last chapter of Philippians. There's a great pastoring right there, by the way. <laughs> Take notes. 
says in verse 10, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, and now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. For now that I am speaking of being in need, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hungry, abundance and need. I can, do th- I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And then you skip down to verse 19. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in the glory of Christ Jesus. Man, I pray that I could have that attitude. That I will trust God in every situation. In plenty and in need, in abundance, in every situation, in pain, in suffering, in joy, and in happiness. We need to have this type of attitude. This is what it means to trust the Lord's provision in our lives. So we must work hard, but we must trust the Lord even in our hard work. We must rest. We must trust the Lord in that as well. God will take care of us through all of it. So we talked about our family. We talked about our church. We talked about our time. And then the next section of scripture, he talks about your children. So we must trust the Lord with our children. You know, this whole passage talks about the first section sets it up and it says, you must trust the Lord, trust the Lord, trust the Lord. Then it says, it actually says the next section is brought to us as the reward for trusting God. Have you ever thought about that? Children, it says here, are a reward. Children are a reward. Now this hits me on a personal level. I don't know about you. We know that when we have children, they are a blessing. We receive gifts from God in this way. Now, I know what you're thinking. They don't always act like a blessing. But that's when the perspective of, that's when a biblical perspective enters and we must think about them as blessings. Here's the thing, though, not just in our personal lives. Think about on a church level. Think about in a family ministry way. A church that is filled with children and students is a blessed church. You ever thought about that? You won't realize this until you go to a church where there's not a lot of kids. Church, sure, kids can be loud. They can tear stuff up. They can cause problems just like they do at home. But if you've been in a dying church, you will understand the principles that children are a blessing from the Lord. They bring hope to the church. They are the future. We can we can never hope to think about our legacy without thinking about our future in our children. So the first thing that he points out is that children are a heritage from the Lord. This speaks directly at our legacy. Children are a heritage from the Lord. Children are a legacy, both as we sit here personally, but also as we sit here as leaders in this church. They are the future of our church. Now I'm going to get a little sentimental right now. If you know me, I'm I'm not very nostalgic, but there is one thing I can be nostalgic about is our kids that have grown up in our church um, is the greatest joy outside of my life, outside of my minute, outside of my faith and my family is watching uh, students and children grow up, grow into godly individuals, raise their family and follow the Lord. You know, I started here 14 years ago and I won't embarrass anybody, but a couple of you in here were in the student ministry. I have been very privileged to be a part of the spiritual formation as the youth pastor. And now I get to partner with them in the children's ministry as they raise their families. So I won't embarrass anyone in this room, but I will tell a couple of, uh, I will embarrass a couple that are not in here that are far away. Uh, I'd remember I was an intern at Porter Memorial Baptist Church in Lexington, Kentucky. I was a 19 year old snot nosed punk, uh, thought I knew everything about ministry at the time. These two middle school kids showed up out of the blue to our ministry. I was just an intern. The youth pastor's like, hey, connect with these guys. So we connected with them, uh, me and another intern. We discipled them for a couple years. We picked them up. They, their parents didn't come to church. We picked them up, dropped them off, ran them around, went to their schools, all kinds of stuff, all the things that you do as, a, as an intern. Now, these two men are grown. They have their own families. One works for Lifeway's Centerfuge Camps as a Fuge Director, Fuge Coordinator. The other is the Vice President of Strategic Initiatives and the Chief of Staff at Southwestern uh, Baptist Theological Seminary. And I just say that because I, 
it's not because of me, it's because of the Lord. But I had a very small part in their spiritual formation. I just think I'm so blessed to be able to watch these men grow up and serve the Lord in an amazing way. All of them, all of the students that have grown up and are living for the Lord, raising their families for the Lord, it is just such a blessing. These kids will grow up into adults and they are the future of the church. They are, the le- we, they are our legacy as believers. Do we understand that? We need to grab hold of this as leaders. We are influencing the next generation. We are pouring into them. We, we, we put the truth of God's word, which is rooted in the gospel of Jesus Christ, in them. Not just to fill their head with knowledge, but to give them biblical truth that's appropriate at their level that will speak to their heart. They need to know theological principles. As they grow, they need to learn apologetics so they can defend their faith. They need to know that Jesus is more important than anything. They need to know that it's not that Jesus is not just a part of their lives, but he is everything. That is our future. We are raising the future giants in our faith. You know, I'm sure maybe you've heard of D.L. Moody. He was a foundational preacher and teacher back in the 1800s. In fact, there's a school that bears his name in Chicago where they they produce ministers year after year after year faithfully. D.L. Moody is, is famous around the world. Thousands and thousands, maybe millions of people were impacted by his ministry. There's another name, though, you may have never heard of. His name is Edward Kimball. Edward Kimball was D.L. Moody's Sunday school teacher. And when D.L. Moody was 18, he did not know the Lord. He was working in a shoe shop, and Edward Kimball felt the Holy Spirit prompting him to go talk to Moody. Went into the shoe shop in the storage room in the back, said, I need, I need to tell you again the truth, the gospel. He showed him, he shared it with the gospel. Eventually, through their relationship, through their connection, D.L. Moody became a believer. And the rest is history. But it was because of a faithful Sunday school teacher that shared the gospel with an 18-year-old kid that he came to faith in the Lord and had a huge a worldwide impact. For the, an impact we still feel today. Can we just stop and let that wash over us for just a minute? Don't ever, don't ever underestimate the impact that you are making. I know that we can get tired. I know that we deal with a lot week in and week out. But these kids need us to stand on the truth of God's word and to love them with that truth. They are the future. And likewise, they will be our influence into the world long after we're gone. Let's talk about influence for just a minute. Solomon says they are like arrows in the hands of a warrior. This is referring to the influence our, children's ha- have, our children have in the world. Of course, in Bible times, more children meant more soldiers, more workers, more everything. We can, you can build your kingdom. They wanted to have lots of children so they could grow the nation. The difference here is we're not, we're not building a kingdom, at least not an earthly kingdom, right? We're building God's kingdom. And we don't actually need real, actual, physical warriors, but we do need gospel warriors. The children that we influence as leaders will be shot into the world to make a difference for God's kingdom. So they must be equipped with the knowledge to make a difference. They need to know the gospel of Jesus Christ changes lives and brings hope to the world. This should really make us think about how we live our lives. Because, you know, teaching is not just what you say. It's also how you live, right? Kids, spiritual formation, discipleship is taught, but it's also caught in the sense that those kids are, are watching us. They're watching how we interact with our spouse, how we interact with our own children. They're watching how we live in different situations and what we say about when, it, when a difficult situation comes our way. Our children, our students are watching us. You know, whenever I would get in kid, uh, trouble as a kid, I would usually come around and apologize, you know, like kids do. You know, I feel, I'm sorry I did that. Well, my stepfather, this would get on my nerves so much when, when I was a kid. I hated it. 
he would say every, every single time he would say, I would apologize. He'd say, well, actions speak louder than words. Actions speak louder. I, he, oh, I can hear him saying it right now. It drove me crazy. But man, as I grow into an adult, I think about that. Actions do speak louder than words. I can say whatever I want. But if I don't back it up with the way that I live, it means absolutely nothing. So we influence our kids, not just well with what we say, but how we live. So we have to be able to know that they're watching. Parents, your kids are watching. Now, this isn't meant to scare us. This doesn't mean to like put us on edge or anything because we're not going to be perfect. But listen, even in the way we handle our imperfection, even the way we handle sin and offense, forgiveness can actually be a bigger lesson that points to the gospel. If we mess up, when we mess up, how we handle that in asking for forgiveness and, and seeking that will show Jesus. If you're able to overlook small offenses and give people grace, that shows Jesus. If we're able to give forgiveness when someone apologizes, that shows Jesus. So our lives can show the gospel to these children simply by the way we live as redeemed people. So we're influencing them, not with just words, but also with deeds. And then they will go into the world and influence it. So my greatest hope for my children, the children in our ministry, is not that they will be successful by the worldly standards, not that they'll be rich by the worldly standards, that the greatest desire is for them to have a walk with the Lord and seek to influence the world around them with the gospel. That's it. However the Lord guides their steps, however the Lord puts them out there and does different things, that, that's up to Him. I just want them to love God and love other people with the gospel. That's the thing we should be pushing for always. So that is our hope for our kids. That is what we're trying to do. They're arrows of influence going out to make a difference. So they are a legacy or influence, but they're also a reminder of blessing and power. The last passage here talks about, we see that uh, a man that has children is blessed. Solomon says that, that person will not be put to shame when he speaks to the enemies at, at the gate. So we know that children are a blessing. We talked about that. We also talked about how we think about them as a blessing. And if we don't, we need to adjust our perspective because the Lord loves children and he sees them as a reward, as a blessing to our lives, to our churches. But what about this other part? What does it mean to not be put to shame at the, at, when the enemy's at the gate? Well, this means that a family could literally rally together defenses quickly. Once again, a nation, a city that had many people, many children, that meant that they were going to grow up into soldiers and they would have many people. They would, their clan would be large. And so this was a blessing, especially in the lawless time of the Old Testament. People were attacking people all the time, trying to increase their kingdoms. So if you had many children... If you had many people, you could rally your troops in a, in a quick way. But here's the thing. The same is true for us today in the church. Of course, not in a physical sense, not in a we're trying to fight people, but in the spiritual battle that we were waging every day. We know that the power comes from the Lord and that we just talked about influence, but we need our clan, that is our church, our Christians to flourish so that we can rally and go into the world for the Lord. Listen, there is an enemy at the gate right now. And it is Satan. Now he is cloaked in many ways, many worldly idols, many worldly ideas. But no, make no mistake, he is at the gate. But here's the thing, we should not fear. We should not fear when the enemy is at the gate. Our Lord is infinitely more powerful than the devil. He has given us his power and his mission, part of which we are carrying out as we influence these young children. And one day they will stand and face the devil in as many forms in the world. We need vast troops that will stand and fight this spiritual battle because we can need to stand together. We must not let Satan have a single one of our children. They are the Lord's property and we must steward them in that way for his glory. 
These children will be our future and they will be our protection. They will be our legacy and they will bring influence in the world. So we don't, I don't, I'm not ashamed that I'm teaching someone the truth of God's word. Never, never. I will stand. If the, whole, if the culture says that God's word is wrong and they want to put us in jail and they want to lock us up, I will teach God's word. I will teach it in jail like Paul did. We will do whatever we have to do to stand on the truth of God's word. And I hope that you're with me in that because that's the only way we're going to make a difference. So this all boils down to how we trust the Lord. Do we trust the Lord with our lives, our ministry, the children in our ministry that we are ministering to? God is ultimately in control. He wants us to simply trust him with our lives, our family, our children, our church, our time, all of it. So my encouragement to you today is not freak out. Don't don't rush out, change a bunch of stuff. The takeaway is to press into your faith in a greater way. A couple of take-home things. Here's some things that can help us in our ministry. Commit to prayer. As family ministry, we need to think about our, our kids that we are in our influence. And we need to pray for them. That's one of the best and greatest things you can do. Take your roster home. And just pray, take your life group sheet home and just pray for your kids. We also need to commit to God's word. Make sure that you are in God's word, learning and being influenced by God's word. Listen, you cannot draw water from a dry well. We must be an overflowing well of God's word. We must also commit to holy living. Let your life be an example. Remember Paul told uh, the church, he said, hey, imitate me because I'm imitating Jesus. I pray that we can say that to our children. Say, imitate me because I am imitating Jesus. Commit to extravagant gospel love. Love is the defining characteristic for a believer. That we live out in this world. Faith, trust for the Lord. That's how we display love to Him. We display love, extravagant gospel love to everyone around us. Especially those kids in our ministry. We must be people that are marked by our Savior's love. And then finally, commit to bold faith. We must be bold to share the gospel with our kids with people in our lives, everyone in our influence. Our time is short, but you can have an immense legacy simply by sharing your faith. These are just some simple, practical ways that you can display faith and trust in your life and your ministry. Listen, folks, it's not rocket science here. We're talking about basic Christian things that we all need to be doing. But as leaders, we can lead out in these things. We can display these things for the rest of the church. We can be an example. Guys, I just want to end by saying thank you. I appreciate all of your faithful service. There's some of you that have been doing this for years and years and years. And you could probably get up and teach this much better than me. Because you guys are just so faithful and you love the Lord. And the Lord is pleased with your service. So just keep it up. You make a huge impact. In fact, we never know what our impact is going to be. Remember, think about, if if you ever get discouraged, think about Edward Kimball. And we need to faithfully lead as if every child will grow up to be a Moody. This is the great thing. Every child will not grow up to be a Moody, but every child has the potential to live out their God-given and God-glorifying mission. It just takes leaders that will trust the Lord in their life and in their ministry. So will you commit with me, join with me in trusting the Lord in this way? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to gather and just to dive into your word and God, see how important our faith is and how we need to trust you, God, how it just connects all the way back to our ministry to children. I thank you for every one of these family ministry leaders. God, I pray you would fill us with your spirit. Give us energy and boldness to carry on in the mission and the ministry. We thank you and we give you all the praise and glory. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen.